Good morning, everybody. It's Mike, and it's uh, welcome, welcome to the Monday morning phone call. Hope you had a good weekend, and you're set to get started on this uh, this work week here. So, if you've got questions, concerns, things going well, things going poorly, now is a great time to bring those things up. Uh, if you've got questions, obviously, the other people are going to have the same exact questions, so everybody can benefit. So, please. Uh, uh, tap those in if you uh, have questions as we go through this. So the first thing I want to cover is we've had a ton of people doing events over the last week. <clears throat> so I just want to run through uh, something that we typically see when this happens. And um, uh, I'll give you, uh, here's the example I want to give. Is we had two guys in Florida who uh, were, within, were in two cities 50 miles apart. So they're both in Florida, both uh, in cities uh, 50 miles apart, both using the exact same flyer and the exact same mailing house. So everything was the same. Same state, 50 miles apart. They were in cities, very similar cities, and using the same flyer, same uh, mailing house and everything. And one guy was one of our top guys. He was writing $17 million a year. And the other guy was one of our guys who was uh, making about $150,000 a year. So the one guy was making close to a million a year. The other guy was making about $150,000 a year. And here's the thing. <laughs> They were, they were getting the same number of people into it. So when they did the same number of seminars. Everything was the same. They were getting the same number of people in to their seminars, you know, within one or two people. And the guy who was making close to a million a year, I mean, he was happy as could be. And you want to guess what the guy that was making $150,000 a year said. Because remember, he's seeing as many people with the same mailer, etc. What do you think the guy that was making $150,000 a year, what do you think he said? I'll give you a hint. What kind of people do you think he said was coming were coming to the event? Let's see some answers here. What, what kind of people do you think that guy is making one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year was saying was coming to the event? Plate lickers, exactly. He was saying plate lickers, broke, bad prospects, exactly, guys. That's exactly what he said. Now I have another question for you guys. So, so Pete, Steve, and uh, Casey, thanks for answering that. If uh, <laughs> do you really think? that the people that were coming to his event were different than the people that were coming to the guy that was just 50 miles away's event. No, they weren't. Exactly, Rick. You're right. They weren't at all. They weren't at all. So, and I'll give you a really clear example of, uh, of, 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 of that here that happened to me last week. I had one of my guys call. He said, um, geez, Mike, you know what? All the people that came, they were horrible. They were horrible. They were horrible. They were the poor. They were poor people. Now, first of all, guys, can I ask you: How do you know if people have no money when they show up at the event? So, are they handing you in their statements? Are they saying, uh, you know, are they uh, turning in their, their profit loss statements for them? I mean, well, how do you know that they're poor? Right? And and here's the kicker: It's hilarious. So this guy says, and I don't, you know, and I'm seeing a guy here in a couple of hours, and I don't know why I'm meeting with him because he's a, uh, you know, he's one. He, he again has no money. Now you want to guess? Later that afternoon, this guy sent me an email, and you want to guess what the email said? So he was a guy who was bitching about all the people who came to the event were horrible, and then he was going to have to meet with this guy in a couple hours, which was horrible, why he was even bothering to meet with this guy because he had no money. And then he emails me later in the afternoon, and guess what the email said? Yeah, he had 1.1 million. And in the fight, he said, and you know, here's the funny thing. I see somebody say, here say, I was wrong. No, he didn't say he was wrong. He completely forgot that he'd said that. <laughs> he completely forgot that he'd said that all these people were, were poor and whatever else. So, <laughs> but he was all excited this person had one one million. Guys, overall, across the country, I don't know how many we, uh, events we had last week. We had dozens of them. Um, People are getting anywhere from, again, 37 all the way up to 90 people. We're still averaging right around that 61 uh, people per event. And I've had some guys call back and say, I've already met with five or six of the peop these people, and, and I'm, I've already found over $2 million in, in uh, possible money. And I'm getting other emails from people saying, oh, these people are horrible, they're poor, they're everything else. So, you know, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say to a guy that says they're poor or whatever else. Cause First of all, I don't know how he knows they're poor when he hasn't had a chance to meet with them, when he hasn't had a chance to look at their statements. But all I'll tell you is we got a, a, a lot more, about two-thirds of the people are saying these are, um, wow, this is awesome. I'm getting something of a ton of people. They have, you know, these are normal people. Some have money, some don't have money, but I've already found, you know, a million, two million uh, dollars. And then I'm getting other people who just say, you know what, I only got like three appointments, so it doesn't matter anyways because they're all poor. So, you know, you're going to have to decide if you're, 
if you're that guy down in Florida who's making close to a million, or that guy down in Florida that's making about 150,000, saying that everybody's meeting with his plate of liquors and poor. You're going to have to, I'll say it again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. All marketing, I'll ask you this question, Do all, does marketing create great prospects? Does super marketing create great prospects or crappy prospects? See, as I'm asking, well, uh, Casey says neither. I see crappy, all the same. Now, the thing is, is uh, uh, if, mark, if, if our industry could create marketing that sold people, that only got wealthy people that were already pre-sold, guess who would be out of a job, you guys? We would. We would be out of jobs because why does the insurance companies even want us in the loop? If they could go directly to the consumer and have people buy annuities and life insurance directly from them, would they even want us around? We're their most expensive uh, uh, expense. We're their most costly expense. So if they could remove us, they'd do it in a heartbeat. But guess what? Nobody, and believe me, insurance companies have millions and millions of dollars to spend on research on marketing. If they could find it, they would have found it. Marketing is not going to create pre-sold rich people to come see you. Marketing gets you in front of people, and then it's uh, your job. I'll guarantee you, and I'll tell you, the guy that made almost a million a year in Florida versus the guy who made 150000 you want to guess on selling skills there? The guy that was making almost a million a year was top-notch selling skills. The guy that was 150 was not top-notch selling skills. He was a guy who had been in the industry too long, who was looking for the, you know, the magic pill that he could swallow because he thought all people were what? All clients were what? All prospects were what? He looked at all prospect, uh, prospects as plate lickers. And if that's the way you look at your prospects, guess how they're going to treat you back? Because you can't hide that. You cannot hide that mentality. Where the guy's making almost a million a year was the happiest, most jovial guy you'd ever want to meet. He always had a smile on his face. He was always happy to meet people. That's the guy who made almost a million a year using the exact same thing. So guys, please, check your attitude before you present to people. Check your attitude before you sit down with people. And if you're just ready to jump on the fact that they're, they're poor based on what they're wearing, I don't know, I, again, I don't even know how the hell these people, these advisors are saying that they know these guys are poor. What if they tell, what if the, oh, here's, well, I'll give you one example of how they tell me. Well, when I went up to them, they said, oh, they, they just are drawing Social Security. Really? How many people do you know? You know, and he says, and it was kind of funny. They're just drawing Social Security because they're wearing nice clothes, and you know, it's like, guys, why do you think that they, as soon as the uh, uh, advisor approached them, that they said they were just drawing Social Security? Well, first of all, do you think he did the Yale clothes correctly? And he admitted he didn't do the Yale clothes correctly. So they saw what he was doing immediately that he was going to be closing them for appointment. So they said, oh, you know, we don't have a lot of money. We just are in Social Security. Why do you think they say that? Excuses, right, Casey? Because here's the thing. When I walk into the store, and I know I'm going to buy a suit, when I'm walking into the store, and I, even though I know I'm going to buy a suit, as soon as the salesperson walks up to me, what do I say? He says, hey, can I help you? What do I say? Just looking, Pete. Exactly. Why? I actually want to buy a suit. I'm not just looking. Why do I say that? Guys, do your job. Be positive. Let the system Filter these people for you. Do not assume. I, and Jeff, when we see advisors assume things about clients, how often are those assumptions right? Yeah, rarely, if ever. Guys, don't assume about. One of my, one of my top clients lived in the trailer court. Um, of my top ten, I had three of them in apartments. Little old ladies who lived in apartments. I had one guy call. I had one guy call me and says, "You know what? This was a failure of a um, event because nobody in that room had over a hundred thousand dollars of income." Dude, these people are retired. How many retired people do you know, guys, that have that are bringing in more than a hundred thousand dollars of income that are retired? I emailed back and then called them and said, "Dude, I I never had of all my clients the year that I made almost a million dollars." Not one of my clients made over 100000 So I, I, I'm confused on why you're worried about their income anyways. Because we find that people with a lot of income often don't have a lot of what? People with a lot of income often don't have a lot of what? You guys should know this. 
They don't have a lot of assets. Right, because guess what people with a lot of income tend to want to do? Live the high life. They want to live the high life. So they're the ones driving the BMWs. They're the ones that have two BMWs, an expensive house and everything else. And guess what they don't have? Money in the bank. So congratulations to the, the, the huge bunch of you that are excited, have made a lot of appointments, and are happy to see those people. The other few guys that are having attitude problems, guys, sit down, take a breath, and think about what you're trying to do here, which is to get in front of people and not assume anything about them. Let the system filter them out for you. Okay, so any questions on that, guys, before we move forward? Any comments? Okay, Missy, any questions uh, come in while I was ranting and raving there? Uh, no, nothing has come in. Okay. Okay? <coughs> Super. So we're going to talk about today then is the agreement meeting. And the agreement meeting is set up to last 60 minutes long, not a minute longer. And why not? Because uh, there are two reasons for a, uh, an agreement meeting to go too long. One is because the guy has been um, doing the old style rapport. He's trying to find, you know, something that they have in common. And then he's going to talk about that and let the client talk about that. And they're going to really bond, whether it's over football or golf or children or whatever. <clears throat> when you do that kind of rapport, guys, what do you look like? What do you look like? You say, oh, yeah, car salesman, Casey. Yeah, car salesman, exactly. But then I, have the, I, was, I was listening to a tape, and I was counseling a guy on this, and he said, you know what? I, listen to them, though. They're not angry. They're not... They're not mad at me. They're, they're happy. They're going along with it. They're happy to have this conversation. Guys, do you really think that people are going to be angry at you if you try to do that kind of rapport? No. They're going to go along with it. But what have they decided about you? They've decided that you're a salesperson. Even though they're smiling, do I want them to think of me as a salesperson or a consultant? A consultant. So we're always happy. We're always upbeat. But we stay on task. Where do we want to develop the trust and rapport? about over golf or about key issues that are emotional to them. We have a place in here to build rapport, but it's not by doing a silly rapport building where you try to find something in common. Guys, they see that a mile away, a mile away. The other the reason you can go too long is you get into a discussion about their investments. And I've already seen uh, several tapes or listened to several tapes last week where this has happened, where the advisor <clears throat> wants to talk all about the investments and then kind of let them know Boy, there's problems here with their, oh, geez, you know, there's a lot of fees here. So well, how do you feel about those fees, folks? Guys, is the first meeting designed to do any selling whatsoever? Do not sell at the first meeting. Why do you not sell at the first meeting? Here's the thing, guys. If I'm a small guy. So if I've got to go up against a big guy and I'm going to fight him, am I going to jab, 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 jab him? Is that how? Because if I just go out and jab this moose, what's going to eventually happen? Eventually, he's going to do what? He's going to kill me. I don't have any chance against this guy. The only way I have a chance against this guy is what? Sneak up on him when he's not looking and put him out with a two by four. Knock him down so he does not get up. Because I can't afford to hurry him to get back up. Why do I bring up that analogy? Because if I start to pick, pick, pick at that guy at the first meeting, if there's anything that I get, if the client starts to get upset about some of his issues at the first meeting, what will they do? So if I get them just a little bit upset about their fees, what will they do? If I get them a little bit upset about um, uh, their investments, what will they do? If I get them upset about anything, what will they do? Call him, somebody said. Call him. You're exactly right. Uh, uh, that's exact. Go back to their guy. Exactly. They're going to go back to their guy and they're going to say, um, you know, it looks like I'm paying a lot of fees here. What are you going to do? Or are you going to say, hey, it looks like this investment isn't very good here. And what's their guy going to say? Their guy's going to say, oh, yeah, you're, no, well, he's either going to prove to them that they're not paying fees or the investment's good or say, you're right, let's, get, let's change that and fix that. But guess what? Possession is nine-tenths of the law. If they go back to their guy, guess who is done, period? You are. So you cannot pick, 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 or get them upset at all at this first meeting. If they get upset at the first meeting, they're going to go back to their guy. Their guy is going to not lock you out. He's going to lock you out. And I don't want that to happen. I want them to not approach their guy between meeting one and meeting two. Because then at meeting two, I'm able to sneak up on that guy without him knowing and knock him down. Because at the end of meeting two, I'm able to do a thorough job and have that client become convinced that they 
not only don't like their guy, that they don't that they hate their guy, they don't trust their guy, and and they'll never want to see their guy again. That's when I want to do it. So don't pick, pick, pick at the first meeting. And again, it's classic. The couple of guys that I talked to last week that were doing this, of course, told me they weren't picking. They were just trying to what? They were just trying to what, guys? I wasn't pick help. That's right, Pete, help. I just tried to help the, the client. I just tried to educate the client. Where in our script does it say to help or educate the client in the first meeting? We don't help or educate the client in the first meeting. All we do is get them to what? Admit that, number one, they don't unconditionally love their guy. Number two is that it would be unfair to themselves to take my information back to their guy. And number three, to tell us if they're going to become a client of ours if we do what we say we can do. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to teach them or help them. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions on that, guys? Good. Okay, so the first, uh, the, the important parts, yeah, no selling, telling, preaching, and teaching, Eric, you're exactly right. So the first and most important part is the setting the tone. And what we're doing here, again, is just making sure they cannot ask questions before they ask questions. Oops, got to go back up here. And then also to um, get them to tell us that we are experts. Not us telling them that we're experts, but them telling us we're experts, so they hand control over the meeting uh, to us with a, uh, on a silver platter. So that's all we're trying to do here. And then these last three, the loyalty versus unconditional love, fair versus unfair, and a little secret close, those are the second most important part of that. Uh, or I'm sorry, those are, that's what we're actually trying to get from the, the agreement meeting. All this stuff in here, you can do it any way you want, as long as you're not doing crappy type of rapport building or talking too long about their uh, investments. Now, that said, some of you have been uh, back for um, uh, uh, our on-site education, and some of you have been on the calls last, um, the last first two weeks of the, the month, and some of you have been doing one-on-ones with Jeff and myself. For those people that have done some intense training with us here in the last month, how much does the script matter? Let's see, get some answers to this. How much does the script matter, guys, that have been on the, uh, some of this more intense training we've been doing the last month? I'm saying, hey, here's this, uh, setting the tone script, hey, here's all these scripts you should matter. I'm hearing not a huge part, not a huge part, very little, exactly. Because here's the thing, guys. These scripts will move the process along, but they're, they're going to move the process along faster. But the main, I don't want you to get bogged down on scripts. As I told some guys that came back to the training here uh, a couple of Fridays ago, I don't care if you tore up all of these scripts. Go ahead and tear up all these scripts. And if you were just to use your old scripts, the old way you used to do business, and simply got on people's side so you never, ever argued with people. So you got on their side, and then uh, instead of telling people your ideas, telling people your points, be, uh, gaining the skill of how to tell, have the clients tell you those things. If you can get on people's side and then never tell pe people anything, never tell people a single thing, but, let, uh, but learn to have conversations with people where they tell you the points you want to make. If you do those two things, it doesn't matter what scripts you have. Those are the skills you need to be working on. And those, and going forward, we're going to work on those skills an awful lot. And we have already been on those on the monthly calls, as all of you are, that have been on those calls are aware of the small group monthly calls. That's what we work on every single month. But we're going to start making it more and more often that we work on those things because that's the most important part. All the scripts do is make it easier, make it faster. So if you're having a hard time grasping these scripts. Don't beat yourself up. Just become much better at getting on people's side and getting people to tell you any point you want to make. If you can do those two things, you can throw the scripts out and you'll still have unbelievable success. These scripts are just going to make it easier for you. So any questions on that, guys? <coughs> any questions on that? So is, are you clear on that? I know a lot of the guys that have done some intense training with us here in the last month get it. Anybody that has not been part of those things, it, it, may be a little befuddled right now. Does any, do you guys have any questions on this? The scripts get you there faster. The scripts get you there easier. But the scripts are not going to make you money. It's the getting on their side and getting people to tell you what you want to what you want to say. Okay. Very clear. Super. So we'll get. I'm going to just zoom through here. We got all the scripts here, and I don't want to go through all of the. Uh, you can read the scripts anytime you want, but I want you to again fully understand why we're saying what we're saying at different parts of the uh, 
uh, agreement meeting scripts. So would it be okay if I gave you an idea what generally happens in these meetings? So now look at here, and again, I talked to two guys last week where this was a problem. Um, we're doing this as they're sitting down. The reason we're doing this as they're sitting down is because if their bottom hits that seat, they're going to start asking questions. And he who asks the questions controls the meeting. So I do not want them to ask questions because if they do, I've lost control of the meeting and I'm either going to have to give them everything that they want, and if I give them everything they want, nine times out of ten, they're going to take that information back to the guy and never come back to us. Or I can try to play this ping pong match with them where they ask a question, I try to avoid asking, answering it, uh, and they ask another one, I try to avoid it. That, that gets us nowhere either. So I, I want to see if I can control the meeting so that they do not ask questions until I tell them it's okay to ask questions. Now, I'm doing a number of things here with this first thing. So as they're sitting down, I say, would it be okay if I share with you, uh, you know, give you an idea what generally happens in these meetings or so? So is that the same or is that different from me saying, let me tell you what's going to happen in the next hour or so. Is that the same or different? If I say, would it be okay if I give you an idea of what happens in the next hour or so? Or saying, let me tell you what happens in the next hour or so. Is it, are they the, am I saying the same thing there, guys? One's a what and one's a what's the other one? Very different, exactly. You're asking their permission, right. So what I'm telling them, what I'm asking permission. So look at this little sentence, what I'm doing. <coughs> I'm, first of all, asking a question, which means I'm controlling the conversation. When I ask a question, I'm controlling the conversation. Second of all, I'm showing courtesy of saying, hey, nothing's going to happen unless you give me permission, which lowers the resistance level. The other thing is I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to share with you what happens in the next hour or so, so they don't have to worry about, geez, I wonder what's going to happen, what he's going to do this hour. So he knows, uh, so they know uh, what's going to happen. So I'm doing three things with this little sentence, all designed to what? Lower their fight flight, lower the resistance level, and it's done in the form of a question, okay? Super. So I'm going to, the first part of this is about handling questions before they come up. So what I'm doing here is simply uh, going through and saying, hey, I'll answer any questions you might have. Of course, those questions have to be a little bit general because I don't know a lot about your specific situation. So, you know, I probably uh, couldn't answer any specific questions anyways. And with your permission, I'd like to ask you some questions, get a feel for your goals. So all I'm doing here is talking about what questions. So I'm putting this all behind us, and it sounds reasonable or unreasonable when I do this? Sounds reasonable. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, sh I guess, uh, yeah, he wouldn't be able to answer any particular question. See, it all sounds reasonable, but if I wait for them to ask a question and then use this exact same script, I sound like I'm avoiding their question, okay? And we don't want to get to sound like we're avoiding questions. So we do this up front, and we do this continually with our system to do, uh, cover those things that they may bring up up front before they're brought up and we sound reasonable. If we wait till afterwards, we sound like we're, we're defending. And then when I get back to, get to the point here where I say it could enhance what it is you've already been uh, able to accomplish, so they say, by the way, do you mind if I record these meetings with blah, blah, blah? Why am I doing this? And why is this bolded? Anybody have an idea why this is bolded here? Why do we bold this? What we're doing here is changing the topic. We're speeding up. That's right. Changing the tone and speeding up. Exactly, guys. So what I'm doing is when I come in here, I'm this, all this right here is all about questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slow down with this last sentence. I'm going to say, and see if we can enhance what it is you've already been able to accomplish. By the way, do you mind if I record these meetings? Because you know, I don't always remember the things the way I used to, and it just helps me focus on what, what your concerns are and make sure it doesn't don't miss anything so I can go back and, and uh, pull, those, uh, pull my notes off of the recording later. So it would be okay if I did. What am I doing there? I slow down here and then speed up here. The reason being is because it changes their mindset. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, he's changing the topic. Oh, what's he talking about? And, and they forget completely what was ever was on their mind before, which was what? Questions. So we're redirecting the conversation to talk about recordings instead of talking about questions. And the reason we do that is so th they're chasing us in their minds to try to figure out what we're talking about. And they, have you ever experienced, guys, when you're talking on the phone to somebody, and you say, oh, I want to ask him something. I'm going to wait till he finishes. He finishes whatever he's saying, and 15 seconds later, he finishes it, and you're like, ah, what was I going to ask? I can't remember. That's the way the human brain works. It's very difficult to keep two thoughts in our mind at the same time. And when one thought replaces the other one, it's difficult to get that other one back. So any, any uh, uh, questions on this? That's all we're doing right here. Then uh, your time is uh, valuable, but so is mine. That's all this is about. It's not a huge issue. This is not very important as compared to that first the paragraph I just talked about. But it's a nice thing to do, saying, hey, you know what? Your time is valuable, so is mine.
Uh, can't tell you how much it costs to work with me. This is important because this next part is important because uh, for a couple of reasons. One is people are worried about how much this is going to cost. And even if you say it doesn't cost anything to come to this meeting, they're always still afraid you might somehow try to slip in a bill of some sort. So what we can do is just talk about the fact that, hey, um, we're paid in a number of different ways, uh, but it depends on what we do for people and how they want to pay, uh, pay for it. So um, that's all we're doing in here is so kind of covering our bets so that if they ever do try to back us into a corner, we can say, well, of course it depends on what I do for you, whether I'm just fixing your beneficiaries or if I'm, if I'm going to help you with titling and your taxes and Social Security. I mean, it depends on what and how much we do, and then it also depends on how much you pay me. So it gives us a lot of leeway to uh, not tell them exactly how much it's going to cost. Why don't we not want to tell them how much it's going to cost at this point, guys? We've been in the conversation now about three or four minutes. Why do we not want to uh, talk about how much it costs? Really, now until when? When do we want to talk about how much it costs? When does a car salesman want to talk to you about how much the car costs? Right at the very beginning? Or after what? When does the plastic surgeon want to talk how much it costs? Right at the beginning? When do the, when do the people who replace a bald guy's hair want to talk about cost? Right at the beginning of the conversation? After they've made the decision to buy. Exactly, you guys. Because at that point, once I've seen that I can get my hair back, how much am I willing to pay to get my hair back? A lot. So guess what I want to come I want the conversation about how much we charge come up? After they've decided they hate their guy and they'll do anything they can to get away from them. That's when I want the conversation of how much it costs. And then at that point, guess what? Do they care how much it costs? How many times have I been asked how much it costs? Never, because they're just happy to get away from their guy and to work with somebody who is willing to tell them these things up front. Okay? So that's all we're doing here. Then we go into the point where relax, you don't have to work with me. This is extremely important. We're going to say, but honestly, the other half of people, just like you sitting here today, don't end up working with me at all. I mean, I'm able to answer all the questions this hour and we'll put some things down on, on uh, some cheat sheets for them to bring home, give them any additional information they need, and they're able to just go home and do these things on their own. So what am I doing there? Why am I telling them? Because remember, they remember the last thing that, they, that I told them. I'm talking about up here, I'm talking about people paying me, but then I'd say, hey, but people just like you're sitting here today, they don't end up working with me at all. Why would I possibly do something that stupid, guys? Lowers resistance, Rick, exactly. Lower, it's an out, right. It's giving them an out. So I'm lowering the, the, the resistance here so they'll actually listen to what I have to say. Otherwise, they're going to be constantly on guard. They call that critical thinking, uh, critical listening. They're going to constantly be on guard to see what's this guy's point, what's this guy's point. I just said here, hey, don't worry, folks. Half the people, just like you said here, don't end up working with me. That relaxes them and say, oh, Okay, so I can just kind of go through this meeting and not have to try to defend myself all the time. It makes the meeting go so much easier. And then uh, we get into the, the main question we're going to ask here in this first setting the tone, which is uh, we want to uh, ask the question, why do you think so many people here in Rochester, Minnesota, work with us here at Castle and Clark? We want to get to that where they tell us we're an expert rather than us telling them we're an expert. And the first way, uh, point that we, uh, way we do that is we get into uh, talking about, hey, communication is two-way. Communication is two-way. And then we're going to prime the pump because uh, with ideas, put, put ideas on top of their mind. What I mean by that is when I finally get to this big question I want to ask them, which is why do you think so many people here in Rochester work with me, I don't want them to have the deer in a headlight syndrome trying to think, uh, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know what he wants me to say. So what I do is I put in a lot of different things uh, that we do that they, could, that they could answer with. So I put these thoughts at the top of their mind. So I'm saying, hey, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the presentation we covered things like the sales software, uh, how to reduce your risk and increase your income from your current investments. We talked about Social Security, uh, increasing your Social Security by 67% with um, just a few of the techniques. So I'm actually priming the pump with question or with answers to my question. So it's a top of mind. And then I'm going to make sure they understand that I'm going to ask them a question, and the reason I'm asking it is to gain feedback. Why do I want to make sure that the re they understand the reason I'm asking this question is for feedback? Feedback, feedback. You can see me say feedback, feed, or have them say feedback, or me say feedback over and over and over again. Why? This is, a, again, another thing we use constantly throughout our system, which is that if people don't know why you're asking a question, they're going to come to their own conclusion why you're asking the question. 
And remember, I'm going to ask them, why do you think so many people work with me? Why, if I ask that question, why do you think they think I might, if I don't do this feedback thing, I just pop that question out there, they're going to say, hmm, I'm wondering why he's asking that question, and what conclusion are they going to jump to? If I'm saying, hey, why do you think so many people work with me at Castle, you know, Class on Clark? Okay, so, uh, Neil, you got it right. You're always telling them why you ask, why you're asking a question before you ask a difficult question. If you tell them why you're asking the question, then they don't have to try to figure out for themselves why you're asking the question. If I just pop out, hey, why do so many people work with me here at Castle and Clark? They're going to say, oh, he's just trying to get me to say he's an expert, and I'm not going to do that. I don't know. They, they know why you're asking it, and then they're going to try to, to defend themselves. I don't want them to defend themselves, so I'm going to get I'm going to uh, let them know exactly why I'm asking it before I actually ask it. And so the reason I'm going to ask this question is to gain feedback. Feedback, feedback, feedback. And here's all the reasons feedback can help uh, help me help people like you. One is the evaluation forms. Here's another good reason. One is the thumb on the pulse. And look at what I'm doing here. And when I talk about the evaluation forms, I again bring up social security and helping people with their social security. Again, priming that pump, putting these thoughts at the top of the brain, and giving them a reason why feedback helped me in the past. Another good reason, thumb on the pulse of the people that I work with. And then I put in there, uh, you know, uh, create more income or reduce taxes. So I'm throwing these ideas in there all the time as I'm talking about feedback, feedback, feedback. And then I actually get to the big favor. You know, if you, if, you know, it would be really important to me or uh, if you do this personal favor for me, it would mean a lot to me personally. If I ask you a question, would you be willing to give me some feedback? What will every single person at that point say? What will every person say? If I ask you a question, would you be willing to give me some feedback? What will jerks say to that? Do jerks like giving you feedback? Yeah. Do nice people like giving you feedback? Yeah. So they're all going to say sure. And then you just simply pop out the big question, which is why do you think so many people here in Rochester work with us at Castle and Clark? And what's the tone of my voice here, guys? You know, why do you think so many people in Rochester here work with us at Castle and Clark? What's the tone of my voice? Subservient. It's uh, submissive. It's high. So it just sounds like, hey, you know, why does it? It's not, why do you think so many people work with us here at Castle and Clark? Which is more in their face. So you, you want to make the, the voice a little bit higher here when you ask that. And, and did I, look at what I did here. Did I uh, say anything else? What they said, sure. I just pop up. Why do you think so many people work with us here at Kesson Clark? Do I, uh, one of the things I see you guys do is they get a little bit nervous. So instead of just popping this out, which when you pop out a question, you're very likely to get a pop out answer. Pop out a question, you get a pop out an, uh, an answer. But if you set it up, yeah, so you know, when they say sure, I've seen guys get nervous and they say, well, you know, I just want to, you know, if I could ask you a, a, a question, um, why do you think so many, no, don't, nothing, there should be nothing before that. Just say, why do you think so many people here in Rochester work with us here at Kesson and Clark? Okay? Just pop out that question, nothing before it, nothing before it, just pop out the question. So any questions on that, guys? That's, that's the whole purpose we want to, of the six, first six minutes is to get to this point where they tell us we're an expert. Did we tell them we're an expert, or did they tell us we're an expert? Guys, think about this. Think about the power of this. In the first six or seven minutes, these people are telling you that you're an expert. Is that good? Guys, is that good? Have you, done, have you ever done that before you came on the 5Q system? In the first six minutes, or really in the first ever during the process, did you ever get people to say that you're an expert? And we're doing it in the first six minutes. Do you get the power of this? This is huge. It's worth investing the time to be able to do this. That six or seven minutes and, to, and, the, and the couple of hours it takes to learn this, it, it, it's worth the time, guys. Okay? So, now they've said we're an expert, I'm going to just make sure that I emphasize that. I say, yeah, you're right. You know, that's exactly why people work with us. I hear that over and over and over. I'm glad that our, my message is on. Uh, on, on task and, and that uh, um, it's clear. So I appreciate you saying that. That's exactly why people, why, I'm emphasizing, okay, you just said that everybody in town that's worried about what you're worried about all work with me. And I want to make sure we all are agreed that that's what you just said. That's what I'm doing there. Okay? So that's it. That's, that's the setting the tone. Then, <clears throat> again, everything from setting the tone until the last 10 minutes of the uh, first meeting, just do it any way you want to do it, except spending too much time 
on the investments or especially giving opinions on investment or trying to do a little analysis on the investment or trying to let the clients know that how bad their investments are, even a little bit. None of that. None of that. None of that. You're just gathering data in a very flat, deadpan uh, way. If, if they want to engage you with, you know, what do you think about <coughs> this uh, mutual fund? I don't think it's been doing very well. You'll say, hmm, yeah, that's absolutely something we should check out. And then you move on to the next thing. That's all you do. You don't say, really, uh, bad? Why, why, you know, why would you say that? How's that been working for you? Well, you know, it, you know, it's been done this and that and the other thing. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's definitely, you know, we wouldn't want, you know, I can see why you wouldn't want a mutual fund doing that. Guys, if I do that, what have I just started to do? If that's how I talk, when they talk about their investments, what have I started? I'm starting to sell, Eric. Exactly right. Advise, Fred. Exactly. Start to sell and advise. And at that point, I'm, when I give that advice, guess what they might likely be want to do with that advice? Go back to their other guy and say, you know what? I, I don't really like this investment anymore. And I think we need to change it. And he's going to figure out that you're in the picture, and you're now going to be out of the picture. So you're flat. You're not there to give it give any advice, you just sit there to gather information. Okay? But then we get to the loyalty versus unconditional love, and this is where we're going to have a conversation with people saying, listen, I, I need to know whether they're going to work with me or not. Because I'm not doing any more work for you without you committing to me. So that's what we're doing here. But we had to do it in a nice way, because if I, I used to try to do this, guys. I used to say, so um, if I do all this work for you, will you work with me? And they say, well, it depends on what you have. And I say, well, I'm not going to show you what I have to work with me. And they say, well, I'm not going to give you the uh, okay to, to, uh, to work with me. And we get into a big argument about this. So this is what I discovered I had to do to get them to commit before I lift a single finger for them. Because at this point, have we done any work for them whatsoever, guys? None. None. And yet we're going to get them to commit to move all their money to us. And here's the uh, example I give. I've talked about this many times about the power of the mind. And the mind cannot tell the difference between reality and what goes on in the mind. I've talked about the uh, free throws, where people that practice free throws in their mind improve as well or as much as people who practice free throws on the court. I've talked about the Vietnam uh, 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 pilot that was stuck in a, uh, a bamboo cage for seven years and played golf for seven years in his head over and over and over. And when he came home, he, the first time he played that course, he got within one stroke of his best game ever on that course. The mind cannot tell the difference between reality and what's, what's, uh, what's happening in the mind. So what I'm doing here with the loyalty versus unconditional love is I'm getting them to see a little movie in their head of them leaving their guy. They need to have this little movie in their head of them leaving their guy. Because if they have that movie and they don't throw up, that tells me there's a possibility they'll leave their guy. Also, it conditions them so that when I actually do ask them to leave their guy or, when, or it makes it easier for them to draw their own conclusion they should leave their guy because they've already seen it happen several times. Guys, aren't we like that? Don't we have to see, uh, before we uh, do a major thing, don't we have to, to see it several times in our mind before we'll take that big step? Or, or when I'm going to ask my wife, when it just, the first time that pops into my brain to ask my wife to marry her, I just blurt it out, right? Is that how we're conditioned as human beings? Or do we think... Do we say, hmm, I think I want to ask her to marry me? And then you start working it through in your mind. You know, is, she, is this really something I want to do? Is she going to, how, what's her reaction going to be? But you start to work that stuff through your mind. You don't just have this spur of the moment of a thought and then boom, do it. But that's how most advisors want to work. They don't even bring up the fact of leaving their guy, the, the client leaving their guy, until they, quote, unquote, prove to them that they should leave their guy. They prove to them by having better solutions or better or showing them all the things they're doing wrong but really that's that's the first time that clients ever actually even thought of leaving their guy and it's like whoa yeah I can see all these things are bad but wow I didn't even thought about leaving my guy I wonder if there's another way I can fix this without leaving my guy oh yeah I guess there is I can just go out back and talk to my guy the loyalty person because there's love is having them first have this little movie running in their head actually seeing them leave their guy so what we're having them do during the loyalty person because there's love is tell us why they don't unconditionally love their guy. See, they'll start to tell you. When you do this right, and you say, well, let's see if I can get here. The first part is loyalty is good. So we you say, hey, yeah, uh, we're, we're happy that you're loyal to your guy. I don't like people who aren't loyal, so congratulations. So we're, again, lowering their resistance level. And we're being honest, right, because it is good that they're loyal. So that's all we're doing here. We're talking about, hey, how does loyalty work? Does it work? Does, uh, does, uh, does uh, loyalty work two-way um, with our doctors? 
Does loyalty work two ways for our friends? Does loyalty even work two ways for our spouses? See, loyalty is a two-way street. I have to, somebody has to be loyal to me, uh, me if I'm going to be loyal to them. It's a two-way street. Even with doctors, friends, spouses, it's two-way. That's all we're talking about here. See, I loyalty again with friends is the same. Loyalty is even two-way with marriage. And then again, but you know, there is one relationship that isn't two-way. That no matter how much money they borrow from us and never pay it back, no matter how much uh, they say they're going to come over and then don't come over, no matter how often I ask them to come over and help me and they don't come over and help me, no matter what they've said behind my back, I still love them. And who is that? And they say they're kids. They say, yeah. And, and then we're going to go through, do we unconditionally love our doctors or other professionals? No. And somebody says, what if they don't have kids? Does it matter if they have kids? Guys, if I say to, to somebody who's never had a kid, and I say, no matter how much they've uh, borrowed from us, no matter how much they've, uh, do, does everybody know what I'm, who I'm talking about? Yes, everybody knows what you're talking about when you set it up. But, you know, so there is one relationship we have with it, no matter how much, because you know what? Unless I don't understand human anatomy and how it works, what was everybody once in their life? What was everybody once in their life? A child. So they get it. Okay, so then we're going to, do you unconditionally love our doctors or other professionals? So they're going to obviously what? No. So then we go ahead and ask them, do they, you know, do we, we're, we're uh, very, very happy that they're loyal to the guy, but the question we have for them, are they loyal to the guy or do they unconditionally love their guy? And at that point, what do they say? Well, I mean, I don't know because you love them. <coughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't know. I mean, I think he's doing a good job, but if he's not doing a good job, I'm going I'm to let him go. Blah, 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 blah. They start to explain out loud why they don't unconditionally love the guy and why they will leave him, which means when they're saying it out loud, what's happening in their brain? They're actually seeing it. They're seeing it happen. They're saying, no, I think my guy's doing a good job, and I'm going to stay with him. And we're okay with that, aren't we? We're absolutely okay with that. All we want to make sure that if we find major things wrong, <coughs> that they don't love the guy so much that they'll want to stay with him, that there are reasons they will leave that guy. That's all we want at that point, right? So that's what we're doing here. And then I let them know I'm a reasonable person. So I say, hey, you know, but if it turns out that your advisor's competent, knowledgeable, doing all the things you want to do, what should you do? Well, we should stick with them. Right. I mean, you look at all, see, these are what I call outs and ins. Anytime I try to lock them in, I give them an out. And then I lock them in, and I give them an out. And then I lock them in, I give them an out. I don't try to put people in a corner. If you put people in a corner, what they're going to try to do is either fight you, or as soon as you turn your head, they'll run away from you. So as soon as they walk out of their office, they'll leave and never come back. So I never try to lock somebody in the corner. Anytime I try to get them to say, well, if this happened, would you do that? And they say, yes. Then I say, but we don't know if that's going to happen. But if this happened, what would happen? But again, we don't know if that's going to See, I'm constantly giving them an out. Does anybody have a question on this outs and ins where I'm, I, I try to lock them in, but then I give them an out so they feel like, well, Mike's a reasonable guy. He's not telling me all this stuff's wrong and I have to work with him because things are wrong. He's saying, if things are wrong, I should work with him. But, if, but he doesn't know that at this point. So he's not really telling me I have to work with him. Do you see, does anybody have a question of these outs and ins? And you'll see in the script we do that constantly. And a lot of guys get a little confused. And why are we doing this? It seems like you're playing ping pong with the, the client. And we are kind of playing ping pong. Anytime we try to lock them down, I have to back out, back out and give them an out. And the reason being is because do these people want to leave their guy? No. And do I want to get into an argument with them about leaving their guy? No. And do they have knee-jerk reactions to protect their guy? Yes. Do I want those knee-jerk reactions to happen? No. So anytime I see them getting a little uncomfortable, I immediately go to an out. I say, but of course, we don't know if this is happening. Or, but of course you're loyal to your guy. And if, you're loyal, if he's doing a good job, you should stay with him. I'm always giving them an okay to, to stay with their guy. All I'm asking is if they find out things aren't okay with their guy, what's going to happen? Does that make sense, or am I getting, uh, are you guys getting confused on that? Hey, can I jump in there, yeah, Mike? Yeah, please. Yeah. It's really important that you do this, because I hear a lot of guys sometimes say, you know, the two skills that we teach you are get on their side, agree with them, and then kind of elaborate on why you're agreeing with them, um, and then get them to tell you it's really, really important that they tell me certain things. One of the things they need to tell me is that they could leave their guy. That has to come out of their mouth. 
But when I talk to people, a lot of times they'll say something like this. They'll say, uh, you know, the client just is like, well, get to the point. Or it feels like I'm interrogating them. It's because you're trying to ask questions that corner them so that they have no choice but to say, I'm leaving my guy. Or those fees are too high. Or I'm not happy with this or that. And when you force them into a corner and ask them questions that make you answer in the way that you want, uh, they can get kind of resentful. And they'll, they, they can sense that they're being backed into a corner. It's really important that you make it, this gives them the choice to say, no, I would stay with my guy, or no, I would leave him. See, now you're not backing them into a corner. They have the choice of, of answering either way. And then it's going to feel like it's voluntary. It's something that they arrived at at their own. If it feels like it's forced or that you're making them say it, they'll resent you for it and they'll get angry. If they feel like they have a choice to answer one way or the other, and it, it's their choice to say, I, no, I could leave, then they're happy. They're fine with it. They own it. See, that's, that's motivational interviewing. That's the whole system was, was developed around the, the financial discipline, or the, financial, the uh, psycho psychological discipline of motivational interviewing, which is to get people to, to, to change their bad habits or break addictions. And the whole premise is the, the, the person has to make the decision. You can't tell them what's right. The person has to tell them what's right. And so Jess' point is right on target, and that actually acts, uh, uh, answers Shell's question, which what do you do with a critical thinker? This works wonderfully well for critical thinkers because critical thinkers always want to be right. Right. This whole system is designed around us never being right. We are never, ever right with this. There's only one person who can ever be right with any part of our system, which is who? The client. So the, uh, they love uh, critical. Half of my um, half of my clients were IBM engineers. So I mean, the, uh, critical thinkers love this because <laughs> engineers always want to be right. Critical thinkers of uh, of uh, college professors always want to be right. And the system is designed, if you do it right, to ne you will never ever 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 be right. You will never be right with the system. You always allow the client. Keep it right, so it works perfectly. So I got a question. Would it not be okay to preface the question by saying that there are times when we find people whose advisors have not been taking care of them? And I'm not saying that this is the case here, but uh, if we are in areas, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's certainly okay. It's all, we're just having a conversation here, guys. Just so you know, the setting the tone script is pretty much word for word. The rest of these things are purely conversational. You'll never hear me doing a, a loyalty versus unconditional love the same way. Never. You'll never the, no, my scripts are never the same. All I'm doing is having a conversation where we come to the same conclusion, which is what? That lo loyalty is good. Loyalty is two ways. We have lots of relationships in our lives that work where loyalty is two ways, and we only have one relationship where it works where there's unconditional love uh, 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 preempts uh, loyalty, and it's not with their advisor. So th th any way you have that conversation is totally okay, as long as like you're doing. Uh, if you follow what Jeff is saying there, which is that you never try to lock them into a corner. Y you let them make their own decision. We're not telling them that they have to to move to us. We're not telling them that things are wrong here. We're just saying, hey, if things are good, you should do what? Well, we should stay with the guys. If things aren't good, you should do what? Well, we should leave. Why? Because you don't what? Well, because you love our guy. That's all we're doing. We're not telling them that's the case. They're telling us that's the case. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Yeah, Shelly, exactly right. You just need to get the same place. Exactly right, Shelly. You don't need to uh, follow the script. You just want to get to the same place. Exactly right. So, Neil, your, your script would be perfectly good. So here we're t and then again, the out is that we're always talking hypothetically here. So we're not telling them things are wrong. We're just saying, hey, if they, if they weren't, what would, what would you do? And then we get into the fair versus unfair. And the fair versus unfair... Um, we, we're going to set it up so that we're going to say, hey, if, I, if we did, you know, again, we don't know if things are uh, uh, wrong here. From, you know, we haven't done a full analysis. We've done some things that are concerning we want to take a look at, but we don't know for sure. So if, uh, if we did find some things, not little things, but huge things, and I did all the work for you, and you took it back to your guy, that would, would that be fair? And what they always say when I ask them that question? Oh, no, no, that wouldn't be fair. And who do they think I'm talking about when I do set it up that way? And I'm purposely doing this. Who do they think I'm talking about? Was it, geez, if I do all this work for you, you know, and, and you know, because there's big things that we find and all that. I mean, is it fair to take my information back to your guy? Who do they think I'm talking about? 
Me, exactly, Fred, me. They think I'm trying to set up saying, you, you know, it wouldn't be nice of you if you took my information back to the other guy. Now, why do we do that? We do that on purpose because we're going to say next, that, oh, you know, I appreciate that, but really, push comes to shove, who are you responsible, for me or for who? When they say, well, for us. So I appreciate you worried about being unfair to me, but, you know, is your, your job to put food on my table, take care of my kids, send my kids to college? Well, no. It's your job to take care of who? Ourselves. So I appreciate you saying it's unfair to me, but I guess I was wondering, would it be fair to yourselves? And we walk them through this situation where uh, we say, um, um, you know, wouldn't it be just easier to take my information back to your guy? I mean, are you, do, are, do you like doing things the hard way or the easy way? And they say, well, no, I like doing things the easy, easy way. So we walk through what they're already thinking in their heads. Why do you think we're walking through what they're already thinking in their head? Guys, if they've got objections, should I air them out or hope they don't come to bite me in the butt? I'm going to air them out. I want anything that I know they're thinking in their head, I'm going to get it out there so we can talk about it. Because if they just let sticks in their head and then I hope that it doesn't come up, I'm going to lose. Air it out. Exactly right. So they say, um, but if you, know, if you did it the easy way, would it really be fixed if you did it the easy way? Just taking ourselves back to the guy. And I walk them through the scenario where that would happen. And I say, hey, do things change? And I go through all sorts of examples. The economy changes, interest rates change, the, the tax laws change, the presidents change. And we do all these things, and, and then do they change faster or slower than they used to? So then I go through this scenario where, well, when things change, your problems will start all over again, right? Because if, there, if your things are fixed for now, but things change, does that mean the same fix will work anymore? Well, no. Which means that, you know, things will need to be made. And since we found things were wrong the first time, you start to wonder what? Well, are things wrong again? So we walk them through the scenario where they start to visualize that, yeah, if, if all these things were wrong, if all these things were wrong and then they were fixed, but then things change again, a year from now I might start to wonder if my guy's not doing his job again. And if he's not doing his job again, I might think maybe I need to check up on it a little bit uh, closer and maybe make a few more phone calls. And when I make those phone calls, is the advisor going to like that or not like it? He's not going to like it. He's going to get irritated. And, but you're going to think, what? Why are you being irritated? The only reason I'm doing this is because a year ago you weren't doing your job. And then he's going to get more irritated and you get more irritated. So we go through the scenario where they realize that, oh, you're right, that would be a bad relationship, and that relationship's going to fail. If I catch him doing all these things wrong, I'm going to constantly be second-guessing him. I'm going to be constantly wondering if he's, what he's doing right. I mean, think about this, guys. If you catch, your, if you catch your, your son smoking dope, and he says he'll never do it again, but then he misses curfew by an hour, what do you start to wonder? See, once people have done something bad, even if they say they'll uh, uh, change, you're constantly wondering about what? Hmm, are they back to the same old bad behavior again? See, if we go through that, uh, that uh, uh, walk that through with them so they realize it, that that's a relationship that's, that's going to fail. So, and then we just basically say, hey, if something as important as family, health, or money, do we want a failed relationship? What do they say? So then I go through it. Is it so it's an it's a, a conversation where uh, they'll come to the conclusion it's unfair to themselves to take my information back to the advisor, not for me, not to me. And then I say, you know what, but still, if that case happened, would it be unfair to your guy to be constantly second-checking on him? And they say, well, yeah, I guess it would be kind of unfair. How about me taking all my information back to that I'd worked to do, put together over hours and hours and gave to you? Would it be fair to, to me to take that information back to the guy? Well, no, it wouldn't be fair to you either. I said, but you know what? Throw the other guy and throw me out. Because is it your responsibility to take care of me or your current advisor? No. Who's your responsibility to? Ourselves. So my question is, would it be unfair to yourselves to do that? And they'll say yes. And then you always follow, see how much uh, you guys have been doing some intensive training. You always follow that up with what? What word? So if I say, so would it be unfair to, but would it be unfair to yourself? Yes, Pete, right. Why? So when I'd say, so your, your job is not to take care of me or the other advisor. Your job is to take care of who? Well, ourselves. And so who would it be unfair to? What would it be unfair to ourselves? And then I say, and why? And then they need to explain to me back in a long-form answer why it would be unfair to themselves. Because then, again, when they're explained to me what's happening in their head, get a, 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 guys, a little what's happening in their head when they start to explain to me why it would be unfair to themselves? What's happening in their head? A little what's running. See, so I want you guys to get this. Why it's so important. What's running in their head? A video, right? A movie. Because then they see themselves leaving their guy again. 
So now they've seen their guy leaving their guy twice in 10 minutes, and then I just simply followed up with the, and again, uh, we, uh, oh, well, we're going to get a little secret close here in a second. But again, we're talking hypothetical here. I'm not accusing, just being philosophical. And again, I'm just going to get them to say it'd be unfair to you. So then I'm going to show them that I have no reasonable, uh, that I'm reasonable and have no pressure. So I say, if you're happy with things, you should do what? Well, you should leave it alone. See if I, exactly. But then we go through, if you're not happy, what should you do? Well, we should leave them because blah, blah, blah. And then I go into the little secret clothes. And the little secret clothes, a lot of guys have wondered, Mike, why are you talking so much about your family? Why, what's the point of talking to your family? Guys, here's what we're doing here. We're saying, I'm, just in general terms, I'm doing the little secret clothes. I'm saying, okay, you just told me you don't unconsciously love your guy, and you told me that you wouldn't take the easy way out. You would move all your stuff to me if we found that your guy wasn't doing things. So they basically have committed to, to working with me as long as I can do what? What I say I can do. So I'm going to make sure they get this, then I'm going to hold them accountable. So now I'm basically going to say, nice, more nicely than this, but I'm basically going to say, listen, folks, I'm busy. I got lots of things I'd rather do. For me, I'd rather spend time with my family than be here at the office. So I'm not here because I think it's a fun thing to be here. I'm here to help people, and that's it. But if I can't help them, I want to be at home. I'm not, I don't, I've been doing this for years. I do not need any more practice. If I couldn't do, not little things, but major things to improve your life, reduce costs, reduce taxes, increase return, reduce chance of running out of money, if I couldn't do big, big things, not little things, but big things, I wouldn't take you to the next meeting. I don't need any more practice. If I couldn't do those things, I'd be at home with my family. So based on what you just told me, you know, that you don't unconditionally love your guy and that it'd be unfair to take my information back to your guy, and based on what I know I can do and what I can't do, I'm going to take it to a second meeting. And because of that, I know you're going to become a client of mine. And I look forward to that. And then I do what, guys? What do I do when I say that? Shut up, Eric. Shut up, shut up, Pete. Yeah, Steve, exactly. I shut up. What if it takes 40 seconds? And that's the record so far in the last 10 years was 40 seconds of silence. And, he, and it worked this time. He who speaks first, what? Well, uh, loses. And a guy who uh, waited 40 seconds to finally answer the question did say, you're right. If you can do these things, if you can do these things, and only if, yes, we will move forward. So he did end up getting that client even though it took 40 seconds. So all we're doing here, guys, is saying what? Are we being unreasonable? We've said how many times that if they're, if, if they're doing well now, they should do what? If things are going great and we don't find anything wrong, they should do what? They should stay with their guy. What if we find only tiny things that, that we can improve? What have we, what have we said? Stay with their guy. We're just asking if we find big... Uh, uh, Roger's asking... What kind of eye contact do you have at that point? What kind of eye contact do you think you have, guys, at that point? Good question, Roger. Guys, what do you think when you're asking that question? Don't blink, Eric. You're exactly right. Direct. Because if you look away, what does that say about your confidence? So you look directly at them, not like staring at them like an eagle. You know, you're just, you know, a friendly, you know, friendly, con uh, like, you're, like you're interested in somebody's conversation. Okay, so this is a very hey reasonable guys. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Well, this is the easiest question in the world if you've done loyalty versus unconditional love and fair versus unfair. It's the hardest question in the world if you haven't done either of those or haven't done them well. So if you're squirming at this point, then I would suggest you need to work on doing loyalty versus unconditional love and fair versus unfair. Like Mike said, if you've already had this conversation. All you're asking them to do is say, did I hear you right? That's, yeah, guys, it's, it's, it, if you're squirming at this point, you obviously didn't get their answers on the other two questions because it's, this shouldn't make you nervous at all at this point because what if they just told you with loyalty versus unconditional love and with uh, fair versus unfair? They've just told you that, yeah, if you could do these things and only if, we'd work with you. That's, that, that's what they're saying. So all I'm saying is, as Jeff said, d are we all clear on what you just told me? And again, I do it in very nice. A little secret close, all very nice. I don't get in their face like I was doing the synopsis there. You know, the script is done very nicely, but it just does say, listen, are you going to do this or not? And then half the people are going to say something like, well, I don't know. I'm not making any promises. You know, I'm going to have to see what you have first. What have they just told me, guys? What have they just told me? Yeah, uh, 
see ya. Uh, well, that's what I'm going to tell them. Because they're not saying see ya. They want all my information for free so they can go back to their guy. They're not ready, Rick. That's exactly what they're telling me. They're not ready. So I kick them out of my office nicely, and I put them on my drip program until they are ready. Now, what if they say this? Though? What if they say, well, you know, if you can do these things, Mike, but only if, is that an okay thing to hear? Yeah, that's exactly what I want to hear, Fred. You're exactly right. Yes, Rick. That's what I want to hear. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, we can't wait to move all our money to you. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, well, I mean, if you can do the things that you say, I mean, if, if, if you do these things or find these things, then yes, we would. That, that's all I'm looking for, because can we find those things at the second meeting, guys? Yes, we can. Uh, Neil's asking, have you had people initially said no but came back later? Oh, ob absolutely. Um, say, people saying no are just simply saying, at this point in time, I'm not ready to make any changes. That's okay. Everybody has different, but you know what? Things change. Do our competitors make mistakes, guys? Do our competitors make mistakes? Do they, does, do they not return phone calls? Do, is, is sometimes when the client calls, are they short or brief, too brief with them? Sometimes do they sound uh, uh, condescending to their clients sometimes? Does, do their secretaries sometimes get grumpy on the phone? Do our competitors make mistakes? Yes. And if you're dripping on them with our full drip program, which would mean on a, on a, a normal client, they're going to get the client's IQ, email newsletter. They're going to get the hard copy newsletter, which is different, but it will be sent through the mail. And they're going to get another little uh, one paragraph email that's, that's designed to give them some interesting information they can pass along to their friends. That means you're touching them three times a month. They will come back. Yes, you will get them to come back. What language is, is used to disengage? What you're going to say when they say, well, if they say, um, well, you know, I don't know, they're not making a promise. Say, you get on their side first. You say, yeah, I mean, why should you be making any promises? I mean, you don't know me from Adam. You know what I'm going to show you. So, yeah, it makes total sense that you wouldn't be giving me any promises to what you have to see. I mean, making promises before you see something, that's a ticket to, 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 to big-time trouble. So, no, I, that makes total sense that you, you wouldn't uh, uh, move forward without seeing what I have to see. And so I've got on their side. So have I argued with them or have I been getting on their side saying, hey, dude, what you just said is totally correct. Have I just done that? And then I'm going to do what? Then I'm going to circle around and say, after I've done it, I say, yeah, so no, not making a promise that makes total sense. So I guess, the, uh, I guess what I'm asking is more hypothetical. If everything's terrific, you should do what? If we don't find anything wrong, we should do what? Well, we should stay with our guy. Yeah, and what if we only find, what if I said I could save you $25 in taxes next year? Is that really worth the hassle of making any changes? Well, no. No, I, no, it wouldn't be at all. I say, yeah, but you know, what if we found $2,500 in tax savings and we found, uh, you know, uh, uh, 5,500 in unnecessary fees a year, and we found all sorts of these other things. At that point, I guess the question I have, again, are you loyal to your guy or do you unconditionally love him? I'm going to go back and do what? Remind them of the two things we just talked about, which is do you un love him or do you, unconditionally, uh, 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 do you unconditionally love him or are you loyal? No. And then I'm going to say, and again, taking that information back to your guy would be the simplest thing to do, but why would that not be fair? And they say, well, it wouldn't be fair to us, but whatever. And they start to explain, explain, explain why they won't leave. And I said, well, you know, at this point, I think, you, I think you've got a, I mean, it's very obvious you've got a great, great. At that point, when I circle around one more time, I will get some people to say, no, you're right, you're right, I see what you're saying. No, I would move to you if, if you, these big changes are made. And that's, so I'll capture some of them the second time around. But if they argue with me the second time, then I'm going to kick them out. And I'm simply going to say, you know what, at this point, it seems like you're, you're, you're really loyal to your guy, which is fantastic. And you're not ready to make any changes at this point, which I totally get. I mean, change is hard. So here's what I'd recommend. Uh, I, I think you should just keep doing what you're doing. And when you get into a position where you think that you're more apt to make some changes or you're, you know, and things slow down in your life when you're able to make those changes, then you can just give me a, 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 a jingle, and I'll be happy to meet with you again. That would be no problem whatsoever. And until then, and then I stand up. Until then, you know, I'll send you out my, my newsletter and keep you posted on, on things that are happening. And you know what? got questions, give me a call. If you get to a situation where you want to make some changes, give me a call. But until then, I think you're doing great. And I just walk to the door. That, have I been mean to them if I do that? So do you guys get that? If they don't give me the answer I want, I get on their side, circle back, review the unconditional, unconditional love um, thing again, review the unfair versus fair again. and Not the whole thing, just review that, hey, do you unconditionally love your guy or not? Do you, do you, uh, do, would it be fair to take myself back? To, all I do is review that. And then uh, I ask them the questions again, and if they still push off, then I just say, you know what? Uh, it makes total sense. I think it sounds like you're great where you're at now, and I think you should stay there. And I get up. As soon as you get up, you tell them what? Conversation's done. 
Uh, do we send them with anything? Company brochures, info, affiliated. Guys, at the first meeting, our job is to do what? Is it to sell? Is our job to sell at the first meeting? No. So should we send them home with a brochure? No. Should we send them home with an article? No. Should we send them home with anything? No. Anything you send them home with is a reason for them to say yes or a reason for them to say no. A reason for them to visit their, with their current advisor or a reason for them not to visit with their current advisor. Don't send stuff home with them. Unless you promise them one of my books at the event as a... As a as a, um, well, I, I, I guess I would go ahead and send my book home because in there, it's not, a, the book is not important. What's important about the book, guys? The book itself is not important. It's not bad if they read it. Will most people read it? No. What's important about the book? What's in the book that your, their current advisor will not have? Credibility, Eric. How? You're right. How? The endorsement letter from me. The endorsement letter from the author of the book saying, hey, you're one of the good guys. So I would send them home with that for a number, uh, if, if you chose choose, because it has the endorsement letter of you, which they will read the letter. They may not read the book. They will read the letter. And if they read the book, how will that book make their current advisor look? If they did happen to read that book, how will it make their current advisor look? Like they're doing their job or they're hiding things from them? It's going to make them look like they're hiding those things from them. So if you're going to send anything home, only send the book, mostly because of that endorsement letter, because most people won't read the book, but they will read the endorsement letter. If not that, send nothing, because you don't want them to have a reason to call their guy or to not come back. Does that make sense? Excellent. So I went over a little bit here. Apologize for that. Hopefully you found it was worthwhile. And um, uh, have a great week, and we'll talk to you next Monday. Thanks, guys.